Well, good morning. morning. Another day, day number three. We're on a roll. We've uh, studied eight lessons so far, and today we are going to get into a study on the fifth trumpet. And basically, the fifth trumpet is going to take all day. There are many, many pages, and I think it'll be a blessing to understand the meaning of the fifth trumpet. And then uh, in the session tomorrow, we'll probably dedicate most of the day, if not all of the day, to a study of the sixth trumpet. So uh, we want to begin with a word of prayer. And so I invite you to bow your heads with me as we ask the Lord to be with us today. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us life this day. We thank you for bringing us together to study your word. We ask that you will bless each session today that you will also bless all of those who are watching the live stream. Lord, we're living, we believe in the last days, and we need to understand prophecy so that we might remain firm in the trials ahead. So give us divine wisdom to understand. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're going to begin on page 127 of our study notes. The fifth trumpet. This is chapter 6 of the study notes. Now in order to understand the fifth trumpet, it is helpful for us to review some elements of what we studied in the fourth trumpet. So we're going to take a look at uh, the fourth uh, trumpet as well as the first four churches of the book of Revelation. Now there's a foundational principle of interpretation when we study the book of Revelation. And that is that the churches, the seals, and the trumpets cover the same basic historic periods, but from different perspectives. Each series adds details that the other series doesn't have. And the churches really are the skeleton of the book of Revelation. In other words, The churches are like Daniel chapter 2 to Daniel. Daniel is the foundational prophecy and all of the additional prophecies in the book build on Daniel 2. The seven churches are the foundational prophecy. They give you the the structure of the entire book of Revelation. And uh, we're going to notice an example of that as we study uh, this morning. Now, uh, let's go to the bottom of page 127 and review the first four churches. The first church, seal and trumpet, describe the apostolic church. The second church, seal and trumpet, describe the period when the Roman emperors persecuted the church. The third church, seal and trumpet, describe the time when paganism penetrated the church in the days of Constantine. The fourth church, seal and trumpet, describe the period when the apostate papal church eclipsed the Bible and the work of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary. Now let's notice Ellen White's remark about the seven churches. In Acts of the Apostles, page 585, Ellen White wrote, The names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to when? To the end of time. While the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. So the seven churches represent seven periods. That's why you have the number seven. It's the totality of the history of the Christian church in consecutive stages, beginning with Ephesus, the apostolic church, and ending, actually, Revelation says Laodicea, but really the church is going to return to the condition of Philadelphia. I won't get into that right now. Futurist expositors, uh, such as Hal Lindsey, and Dave Hunt, who are not Seventh-day Adventists, they believe in the rapture of the church and all of this uh, literal interpretation of prophecy at the end of time. 
they agree that the seven churches represent seven periods of Christian history. So this is not a unique Seventh-day Adventist view. This is a view that is held also by non-Adventists. Now what we want to do is take a look at the fourth church because we're going to find that in the fourth church we have a summary of the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpet. So uh, the paragraph just before the title in yellow here on page 128 says, the central protagonist of the fourth church is whom? Jezebel. It is clear that Jezebel cannot be a literal person because during the dark ages literal Jezebel was already dead. Uh, it doesn't take much intelligence to figure that out. It is obvious that Old Testament Jezebel did not live 1,260 years. Now the mention of Jezebel in the church of Thyatira, the fourth church, makes it necessary to study what? The Elijah story, because Jezebel is the central protagonist of the Elijah story. Let us compare the Old Testament story with the period of the fourth church, Thyatira, because there's a striking parallel between what happened in the days of Elijah and what happened during the church of Thyatira, the fourth church. Here is the description of the fourth church with my explanatory notes in brackets. So what you have in brackets are my comments about the message to the church of Thyatira. We will notice that the fourth church actually summarizes the central events of the fourth, fifth, sixth, and I will add seventh trumpet as well. You say, well, how is that? Well, we're going to notice that the fourth church describes the 1260 year persecution, it describes the French Revolution, it describes the period of judgment, and it also describes the conclusion of the judgment when Jesus takes over the kingdom. You say, well how is that? All of that is in the fourth church? Yes. Do you remember Daniel chapter 7? In Daniel chapter 7, you have these four beasts. You have a lion, you have a bear, you have a leopard, you have a dragon beast, the dragon beast sprouts ten horns, then a little horn comes up and rules for how long? Time, times, and the dividing of time. Now at the end of the time, times, dividing of time, there's a judgment scene, right? In other words, Jesus goes into the presence of the Father, the Father sits, the judgment begins, Jesus goes into the presence of the Father to receive the kingdom. What is the kingdom? The kingdom are the people that have been proved in the judgment to be followers, true followers of Jesus. So are you with me? Now we're going to see all of those elements here in the church of Thyatira. So let's go to the bottom of page 128 and take a look at the church of Thyatira to see if we can find all of these stages. The fourth trumpet, we said yesterday that the fourth trumpet represents what? The period of papal dominion during the 1260 years. We're going to find the fourth trumpet, the fifth trumpet, the sixth trumpet, and the seventh trumpet summarized in the message to Thyatira. So let's go to Revelation 2 and verse 20. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Because you, this is the church of Thyatira, allow that woman whom? Jezebel. Jezebel. So who is at work in the church of Thyatira? It is Jezebel. Immediately that tells us if you want to understand this you have to go where? You have to go back to the original story where Jezebel is mentioned. You have to go back to the Elijah story. By the way, is Jezebel also symbolized by the beast of Revelation 13 and the harlot of Revelation 17? Yes. Is it the same power that ruled 1260 years? Absolutely. So let's continue. You allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit, and the New King James says sexual immorality, but really uh, it is fornication. Let me ask you, whom did Jezebel fornicate with? She fornicated with the king of Israel. 
did the papal church fornicate with the kings of the earth? See we're, we're dealing with symbols here. Jezebel is not literal, so the fornication must be what? Must be symbolic with the kings of the earth. So it says, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication. That's a union of church and state. Did that happen during the 1260 years? Absolutely. And to eat things sacrificed to idols. Does that involve idolatry? Yes. Was the church idolatrous during the 1260 years? Yes. Absolutely. And I gave her time to repent of her fornication. How much time? Time, times, and the dividing of time. Are you with me or not? Yes. Now let's continue. Did she repent? Nope. No. And she did not repent. So what does God say? Because she did not repent, something's going to happen. Indeed, I will cast her into a what? Sick bed. What does that refer to? The deadly wound that was given to the papacy. In other words, Revelation 13 tells us it's the deadly wound. So we have to look at all of these things together. The story of Elijah, we have to look at Revelation 13, we have to look at Daniel 7, because they're all describing the same period of history. So it says here, Indeed I will cast her into a sickbed, and those co who commit adultery with her, who would those be? The rulers, right? So, so the harlot is going to be cast into a sickbed, and also the rulers who fornicate with her are also going to be cast into a sickbed. And they're going to be cast into what? Great tribulation. What does the great tribulation here refer to? It refers to the French Revolution. Let me ask you, was the French Revolution a huge upheaval against the harlot that sent her to her sickbed? Was it also a traumatic event for, the, for the, uh, those who were ruling in France? Absolutely. So this is describing the French Revolution. It says, unless they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children. Oh, the harlot has children. Who are the children of the harlot? Ah, the harlot is the mother. So she must have what? So she must have daughters. What do the daughters represent? They represent apostate what? Apostate Protestantism. So it says, I will kill her children with death. And all the churches, see now all of the churches, all of human history, all of the history of the church is involved here. And all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the heart. What is that a description of? The investigative judgment, right? Is that parallel to Daniel 7? Immediately after the speaking of the little horn that ruled time times and the dividing of time, you have what? the investigative judgment in heaven. And here, immediately after speaking about Jezebel, which is the same power that ruled during the 1260 years, it says that God searches the minds and the hearts. And what is He going to do? He is going to what? The judgment is going to determine the reward, right? And so it says, And I will give to each one according of you, according to your what? According to your works. That is describing the time when Jesus comes to take His people home. The people that have been shown to be His followers in the investigative judgment. Are you with me or not? Yes. So the church of Thyatira, by the way, describes the fourth trumpet, which is the period of papal dominion. It describes the fifth trumpet, the French Revolution. It describes also the sixth trumpet, we're going to notice, because uh, she is going to have a resurrection and it describes also the seventh trumpet when the judgment is over and Jesus takes over the everlasting kingdom with the subject of His kingdom that have been determined during the investigative judgment. Are you following me or not? This is an amazing passage. Now we're going to unpack this in the next few minutes. I'm not going to read everything that we find in the Elijah story, all of the Bible verses, because we have way too much to cover but uh, I'll pick and choose. Now let's go to page 129. In the Old Testament story that is parallel to the fourth trumpet, by the way, Jezebel is uh, shown to be a pagan priestess who introduced 
a syncretistic hybrid religion. In other words, it was not pure paganism, it was paganism mingled with the worship of the Lord. That's the reason why Elijah said on Mount Carmel, why do you limp between op two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him, and if Baal, follow Him. But don't try to follow both. So she introduced a syncretistic hybrid religion that led God's people Israel into what? Into apostasy. In Revelation, Thyatira represents the period of history when the Christian church blended paganism with what? With Christianity. Does the papacy claim to be a Christian system? Did it embrace a whole bunch of, of uh, pagan practices? Absolutely. There's the parallel. And this church behaved like Jezebel. This spirit is the same as the fourth trumpet. So let's compare the story of the historical Jezebel with the story of the prophetic Jezebel. And we're going to draw 11 parallels between historical Jezebel, the Old Testament Jezebel, and of course those who accompany her in the story, and what happens during the period of the fourth trumpet. First parallel is that historical Jezebel led Israel into what? False worship to what? To the sun god Baal. Now you can read that in 1 Kings chapter 16, 30 and 31. It's right there. The last part of the verse says that uh, Jezebel joined with King Ahab and Ahab went and served Baal and what? And worshiped him. So there's the worship of the sun god. Ellen White has a very interesting uh, statement at the bottom of page 129. And by the way, you can read also from secular sources, Easton's Bible Dictionary. Let's read that one first. The sun god, under the general title of Baal, or Lord, was the chief object of worship of the Canaanites. Each locality had its special Baal, and the various local Baals were sum up, summed up under the name of Baalim, or Lords. Each Baal had a wife, who was a colorless reflection of himself. And uh, that, of course, is the moon goddess, Asherah. So, uh, and by the way, that's why they worshipped idols of silver and gold. Silver was in honor of the moon, and gold was in honor of the sun. So, what was Baal? The sun god. Ellen White confirms this. In um, Great Controversy, page 583, she wrote, Though in a different form, idolatry exists in the Christian world today as verily as it existed among ancient Israel in the days of Elijah. The God of many professedly wise men, of philosophers, poets, politicians, journalists, the God of polished fashionable circles, of many colleges and universities, even of some theological institutions, have mercy, is little better than Baal, the what? The sun god of Phoenicia. So what was Baal? The sun god. So what worship did Jezebel introduce into Israel? Sun worship. Did the church during the 1260 years have anything to do with the, with the sun? Yeah, it's no longer the, the literal sun. We're not dealing with worshiping the literal sun. We're dealing with worshiping when? On the day of the sun. Sun day. And in a previous presentation, I showed that basically it's the same principle. You know, anything that man makes for worship and is idolatry. The first day of the week is not a day of worship. So if you make it a day of worship, that's idolatry. God did not create the sun as an object of worship. So if you make it an ob object of worship, that's idolatry. It's the same basic principle. Now, prophetic Jezebel also does the same thing. Does prophetic Jezebel introduce uh, idolatry into uh, the church during the 1260 years? We're at the top of page 130. Absolutely. We're told here that uh, Jezebel, the Jezebel of the 1260 years, introduced idolatry, led people to eat things sacrificed to idols. Uh, you have this statement from Ellen White, the spirit of concession to paganism 
opened the way for a still further disregard of heaven's authority. Satan tampered with the fourth commandment also, and essayed to set aside the ancient Sabbath, the day which God had blessed and sanctified, and in its stead to exalt the festival observed by the heathen as the venerable day of the sun. Do you see the connection that Ellen White makes with the worship of the sun with the worship on the day of the sun? Now the second parallel that we have is that Jezebel is called the mother, and she is a harlot, and she is involved in the occult. Hmm, interesting. Is that true also of prophetic Jezebel, the Jezebel of the 1260 years? Absolutely. Notice Revelation 17 verse 1, 2, and 5. I'm not reading the historical part, you have it right there, because uh, in, we, we don't have enough time to do everything that we have in this uh, study manual. It says in Revelation 17 verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great what? Harlot. So you have a harlot in both stories. Who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Is that true also of Jezebel with Ahab? Absolutely. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And on her head a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the what? The mother of harlots. The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So the end time uh, harlot, who is also the harlot during the 1260 years, is referred to as the what? As the mother. She's a harlot and she's involved in the occult. Is the papacy also involved in the occult? Notice Revelation 18 and verse 23, speaking about Babylon. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. What is at the root of the occult? What is at the root of spiritualism? The idea that the dead are not dead, the immortality of the soul. Is Roman Catholic theology based on the idea that the dead are not dead? You look at the entire theology of the Roman Catholic Church, it is based on the idea of the immortality of the soul. You pray to the saints, you pray to Mary, you know, you, you do special masses for people who are dead, uh, you know, people go to hell and to burn while they're alive, or they go to purgatory to purge their, purge their sins. Everything is based on spiritualism. And the idea, of course, of spiritualism is based on the immortality of the soul. Let's notice the third parallel. The issues in the day of Elijah are the same issues that involve the papacy during the 1260 years as well as in the end time. What are the issues? The first issue is concerning the law of God. The second issue is concerning worship. And the third issue has to do with the true gospel. Now, were these the three issues of controversy in the days of Elijah? Yes. 1 Kings 16, 30 and 31, I'm not going to read it, but you'll find that we are told there that Ahab, of course, and all of Israel went and served Baal and worshipped him. So worship is involved. Is the law involved? Absolutely. When Elijah meets Ahab, what does he say to Ahab? You have forsaken what? The commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. So are the commandments involved in the story of Elijah? Absolutely. Is the gospel involved? Yes. Absolutely. You say, how do we know that? Well, you know, what did Elijah do when he went to Mount Carmel? The first thing that he did was repair the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. What is it that was placed on the altar? Sacrifices. What did the sacrifices represent? They represented the death of Christ for sinners. So was the gospel torn down during the days of Elijah? Three issues, worship, the commandments of God, and the pure gospel. By the way, yesterday we studied that the Roman Catholic system, uh, what did it do with Jesus Christ? It eclipsed the work of Jesus Christ. 
and it also eclipsed the testimony of the church. And so this is parallel to what we studied yesterday. Now let me ask you, in the book of Revelation do we have the same three issues? Absolutely, on page 132 you have the issues. Revelation 13 verse 4, so they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. The beast is a symbol of the papacy. And they what? They worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? So is worship involved when it comes to the beast, which is the same as Jezebel? Yes. Is the law involved during the 1260 years and at the end of time? Yes. You know Daniel 7, 25. It says that the little horn, which is the same as the beast or the harlot, thought that it could change what? It could change God's holy law. Also is the true gospel involved? Remember we studied Daniel 8 yesterday. What did the papacy do? Instead of the showbread it gave what? Tradition. Instead of the once for all sacrifice it established the mass. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, the light of the church enlightening the world it was the period of the dark ages. Instead of the intercessory work of Christ a counterfeit priesthood now was placed to intercede. Did the papacy interfere with the true gospel? It most certainly did. Now notice the fourth parallel. During the period of historical Jezebel because of the apostasy there was no what? There was no rain. Is that true also of the 1260 years? Notice Revelation chapter 11 and verse 16. That's the top of page 133. These, that is the two witnesses, what do the two witnesses represent? the Bible, the Old and New Testament. What do they have power to do? To shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. Are you catching the point? Yeah. So was there any rain because of the apostasy in the times of Jezebel? No. Was there any rain during the period of spiritual Jezebel? Absolutely not. And uh, by the way, why was there no rain during the 1260 years? Well, uh, we find here in 2 Chronicles 7, 13 and 14 the answer. God says, when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land and send pestilence among my people, if my people that are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Ah, and now comes the key portion that most people don't quote. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Why was there no literal rain during the days of Elijah? Because people were in apostasy. Why was there no rain during the 1260 years? Because people were in apostasy. And what does the rain represent? The rain represents the absence of what? Of the Holy Spirit. And that's the reason why the candlestick doesn't have the oil and therefore it's the dark ages because the candlestick, the church does not give light. Now let's notice the fifth parallel. This is the bottom of page 133. How long did it not rain in the days of literal Jezebel? James 5.17 tells us, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. How long is that? Time, times, and the dividing of time. Of course all of this is coincidence. <laughs> you think? No. What is literal in the Old Testament becomes symbolic during the church period. Now let's notice uh, Revelation chapter um, this is, I don't have the reference here, but uh, this is found in the story uh, of the church of Thyatira. It says, I gave her what? Time. The word is chronos. What word do we get from chronos? Chronology. I gave her chronological time, that is 1260 years, to repent of her sexual immorality or her fornication, and she did not repent. How long did God give a Jezebel the harlot to repent? Notice Revelation once again. This is Revelation chapter 11. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy how long? 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1,260 days is equivalent to what? 
time, times, and the dividing of time. Notice Daniel 7.25, He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law, then the saints shall be given into His hand, for how long? For a time, and times, and half a time, three and a half years. But here they are symbolic years, in the Old Testament they are literal years. Are you with me? Very important principle. Now let's go to the next parallel, parallel number six. Was there a faithful remnant in the days of Elijah? Yes, not only Elijah, but also what? Oh, I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So was there a faithful remnant, a minority? Yes, there was. Was there also a remnant in the church of Thyatira? Here's a very interesting word. Revelation 2, 24 and 25. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira. Now that is not a good translation. The, the, the expression the rest is the Greek word loipos. It's the same word that is used in Revelation 12, 17, where the dragon goes against the remnant of her seed. Loipos should be translated remnant. Was there a remnant in Thyatira? Yes, there was. So it says here, now to you I say, and to the remnant in Thyatira. What characterized the remnant? Oh, as many as do not have this doctrine. In other words, those who did not follow the teachings of Jezebel, who have not known the depths of Satan. So is there a faithful remnant during this period? Yes. I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast what you have until I come. Let's notice a seventh parallel. Who was blamed in the days of Elijah for everything that was occurring? Elijah. Was he hunted by the powers that be? Yes. Notice 1 Kings 18, 17. Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? Who was blamed to be the troubler of Israel? It was Elijah. And so now they hunt for him. Notice 1 Kings 18, verse 10 and verse 17. As the Lord God lives, there is no nation or kingdom, this is Ahab speaking, where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. This is a messenger sent by Ahab to Elijah. He's saying, you know, my master has sent me to look for you everywhere. And when they said, he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. So did they hunt for Elijah? Did they try to hunt them down to destroy him? Absolutely. Is that true also of prophetic Jezebel's period? Notice here, Revelation 12, verse 6, the woman, then the woman what? Fled. Oh, she fled. Why is she fleeing? On vacation? <laughs> no, she's fleeing because Jezebel, the spiritual Jezebel, wants to finish her off. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So you have this parallel, historical Jezebel and Ahab, persecute uh, Elijah and blame him for its happening. The same happens during the 1260 years. Let's notice parallel number eight. Where did Elijah find refuge? He found refuge in the wilderness, right? Where did prophetic Elijah during the period of Jezebel find refuge? Ah, notice Revelation chapter 12 verse 6 and verse 14. Then the woman fled into where? The wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. In verse 14, however the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she, she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. So Elijah is protected when he flees to the wilderness, and the church during the period of spiritual Jezebel also flees and goes to the wilderness. What happened with Elijah there in the wilderness? He starved to death, right? 
No, he was fed by God, he was nourished by God. Notice what we find in 1 Kings 17 verse 4, and it will be that you shall drink from the brook. I have commanded the ravens to what? To feed you there. So was, the, was historical Elijah fed? Yes. 1 Kings 17 verse 6 says, The raven brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Is this true also of prophetic, Jeze uh, prophetic uh, uh, Elijah during the 1260 years? Absolutely. Let's read Revelation chapter 12 again, verse 6. Then the woman fled into the wilderness, where she has a place prepared by God, that they should, what? Feed her there. And then uh, the verse 14 says that she would be what? Nourished there. Are you seeing the parallels? There's just too many parallels for this to be a coincidence. You see, the key, the key point is that the church of Thyatira mentions Jezebel, and Jezebel never appears alone. Whenever Jezebel appears, her, her bad company appears too, her three enemies, which are the prophets of Baal, Jezebel, and, uh, and Ahab, the king. Now let's go to the next parallel. Parallel, uh, parallel number 10. Was the harlot Jezebel a murderer of God's people? Yes, you can read that in 1 Kings 18 verse 4 where it says that Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord. And uh, in 2 Kings 9 verse 7 it says, You shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. 1 Kings 19 1 and 2 basically says the same thing, that Elijah had to run for his life from the wrath of Jezebel. Let's notice the parallel uh, at the top of page 137. Did spiritual Jezebel or symbolic Jezebel persecute God's faithful people during the 1260 years? Yes. Notice Daniel 7:25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. In Revelation 17 it even speaks of the harlot. Jezebel was a harlot. So here you have a harlot in Revelation 17, and what characteristic does she have? I saw the woman what? Drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Chapter 18 and verse 24 adds, And in her, that is in this harlot system, was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So, very interesting parallels, aren't they? Yes. Now let's notice the last parallel, parallel number 11. Jezebel had false prophets, right? Yes. That did her bidding. But do you know that she also had a daughter who did her bidding? Yes. Incidentally, I might say that uh, the false prophets and the daughter are interchangeable. Let me ask you, in Revelation chapter 13, does the mother have daughters? Yes. That what are they? It's called the false prophet, right? Mm -hmm. But in Revelation 17, the harlot's followers, I'll call her what? Her daughters. Now, what we have to do is we have to compare two stories. The story of Elijah in the Old Testament and you have to compare the story of the New Testament Elijah. Who is the New Testament Elijah? I'm not talking about this end time Elijah, 1260 years, I'm talking about the New Testament Elijah, who is whom? John the Baptist. How many enemies led to the death of John the Baptist? Three. By the way, Jesus identified John the Baptist as Elijah three times. Matthew 17, Matthew 11, and Luke chapter 1. He identified, he said, this is Elijah. Of course, not in person. He came to do the work of Elijah, to prepare people for the first coming of Jesus. Yes. Now, have you ever read the story of the death of uh, John the Baptist? The Elijah of the New Testament? Mm -hmm. There's King Ahab. Is he the dangerous figure in the story? No. no, he's not the dangerous figure. You know, he would have done nothing unless it was for whom? 
Ah, for Jezebel, right? But Jezebel used her false prophets to what? To extend the false religion of Baal and to search for Elijah. So in the Old Testament of Jezebel, the false prophets do what she says because they eat at Jezebel's table and you don't bite the hand that feeds you. And, and so they want, uh, you know, this union in the Old Testament of Jezebel influencing the king who had a weak character uh, and using the false prophets, they try to seek out uh, Elijah to kill him. Now in the story of John the Baptist, the king, is he a wimp? Yes. Was, was Ahab a wimp? Yes. They're the same character, he's a, he's a wimp. <laughs> Excuse the expression, but you understand what I'm saying. You know, he actually liked John the Baptist. You read the story in Mark chapter 6. He enjoyed sitting and listening to him. But there was a harlot who hated, he, who hated John the Baptist. Who was it? Herodias. And by the way, she was an adulterous woman because she was sleeping with someone who, who was somebody else's husband. Right? And so what did she want to do? She wanted to kill John the Baptist, but it's like she had a deadly wound. She couldn't. It says there in Mark chapter 6. And so what does she do? She says to her daughter at a banquet, she says to the daughter, Hey, um, you know, ask the king to give you the head of John the Baptist. And I'm shortening the story. And the daughter says, Mother, what are you saying, mother? No, the, the, the daughter, it says immediately, like mother, like daughter. The daughter goes and says, give me the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. And that's how John the Baptist died. The end time trilogy or enemies are the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. The dragon represents the kings of the earth. The beast is the papacy or the harlot. And the false prophet are the daughters. Is the same going to happen at the end of time? Are the kings of the earth the primary danger for God's people? Yes. No, the kings are not. Who tries to influence the civil powers of the world? The papacy, but she has what? A deadly wound. So she needs whom? Her daughters or the false prophet to do her bidding. Are you with me? Yes. This, this is not speculation. This is what the Bible calls typology. This is typology, type and anti-type. Now did Jezebel, see Jezebel not only had false prophets, she had also an apostate daughter that did her bidding. You say, now wait a minute. Do you know who usurped the throne, the throne after Jezebel? Her daughter called Athaliah. Let's read about Athaliah in Bible Commentary, volume 2, page 1038. Very interesting. With her seductive arts, Jezebel made Jehoshaphat her friend. That was the king of Judah. She arranged a marriage between her daughter Athaliah and Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat. She knew that her daughter brought up under her guidance and as unscrupulous as herself would carry out her designs. Are you seeing the parallel? Now, let's uh, unpack this. Who are the daughters when it comes to the 1260 years and the end time? Well, the daughters represent the, the, the Protestant denominations that were born from the mother in the 16th century. Let me, let me ask you, did the daughters totally sever their relationship with the mother? You know why the Protestant churches are going to return to the mother? Because they never fully broke away from the mother. They, they kept some of, the, uh, some of the doctrines of the mother. Two of them primarily, well actually three. Sunday as the day of worship. The immortality of the soul and an eternally burning hell. Those will be the links, Ellen White says, that Sunday and the immortality of the soul will be the glue that will bring them together. So the daughters were never able to sever their relationship with their mother and they will come back to mother. 
Let's read Revelation chapter 17 verse 5. This is page 138. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And uh, we notice in Revelation 2, Thyatira, I will kill her what? Her children with death. So Jezebel has what? Children. You know, at Vatican Council II, the uh, ice began to melt be, uh, in the relationship between the Protestants and the Catholics. And there were actually Protestants that went as, uh, as observers to Vatican II, which took place between 1962 and 1965. And I want you to notice a couple of very interesting statements here uh, that uh, were made by Roman, Catholic, uh, Roman Catholics at the Council. First of all, John 23, who was the one who called the Council, the Pope, he uh, addressed the Protestants who were there observing in the following way. The Roman Catholic Church, she wants to be an affectionate, kind, and patient what? Mother. She is moved by compassion and goodness toward her alienated children. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, Pope Paul VI, who follows John the Twenty-Third, uh, during Vatican Council II, added, because of their position, separated brethren as are the object of deep and tender affection on the part of the mother church. It is a love that feels grief and sadness, the love of a heart wounded by estrangement, because the estrangement prevents our brethren from enjoying so many privileges and rights, and makes them lose so much grace. But perhaps for this very reason, its love is all the deeper and more burning. Very, very interesting. The mother saying that the Protestants are her what? Children. Notice great controversy, 382 and 383. Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized what? Churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. And in the Spalding McGann collection, page one, this is a significant statement. I wish I had time to unpack the, enti the entire statement. This is just a portion. Then I saw the mother of harlots, that she that the mother was not the daughters, but separate and distinct from them. She, that is the mother, has had her day, and it is past. And her daughters, the Protestant sects, were the next to come on the stage and act out the same mind that the mother had when she persecuted the saints. Are you catching the picture? And Protestants today, they think that, that uh, this Pope is marvelous and magnificent because he speaks about helping the poor and taking care of creation. And he washes the feet of prisoners. They say, you know, th th this individual is the one who can bring the world together in love. Why? Because they've cast aside the shield of truth, which is this book. Doctrine means nothing to Protestants anymore. It's just, oh, let's just all uh, agree to disagree. Let's, let's just all get together and feel good together. Doctrine and truth means nothing anymore in this world. Postmodern thinking has destroyed the idea that there's such a thing as absolute truth. But there is absolute truth, and it's in this book. Amen. Now, we have one more thing that we need to do. Is there going to be an end time Elijah? Yes. Yes, there is. The Elijah of the 1260 years is not the final Elijah. The conclusion of the story is still in the future. We know this for several reasons. At the end of the 1260 years, the civil powers mortally wounded Jezebel, but did not totally what? Annihilate her. Second, the daughters of Jezebel are still what? 
alive and well. So they haven't been killed the way that, uh, that, that we're told in the message to the church of Thyatira. Third, the great and terrible day of the Lord has not yet what? Come, and God promises to send Elijah before the great and terrible time of the Lord. And finally, God did not yet translate the church to heaven like He did Elijah. So are we to expect another Elijah? Yes. By the way, does the Old Testament uh, tell us that there is going to be another Elijah? Yes. Uh, it says in Malachi chapter 4, and I'm not going to read this entire passage, uh, Malachi chapter 4 verses 1 through 6, that the day is coming burning like an oven, uh, the wicked will be stubble, they will be burnt up, neither root nor branch will be left. Is this describing the coming of Christ in fire? Yes, but what is he going to do before he comes? Ah, let's notice verse, uh, let's go down here to verse 4. There are two individuals that are mentioned here. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. So who is brought to view? Moses. Who else is brought to view? Behold, I will send you whom? Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. By the way, if you go to Revelation chapter 11, the two witnesses really are Moses and Elijah. The work that Moses and Elijah did. Because the witnesses turn water into blood. We're going to study this later on. Who turned water into blood? Moses. And they make fire come down from heaven. Who brought fire down from heaven? Elijah. So the mention of Moses has to do with God's commandments. The mention of Elijah means bringing God's people back to the roots to prepare for the coming of the Lord. Now why will there be an end time Elijah? Well because there's an end time Jezebel. If you have Jezebel you have to have, uh, you know, uh, Elijah too, right? And you have to have also um, uh, Ahab, the kings of the earth, and you have to have the daughters because they all are in the same story. They all work together. Now, Revelation 6, 9 through 11, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to finish this in this time period. We'll ha have to come back to it. But Revelation chapter 6, 9 through 11 is the fifth seal. The fourth seal represents the period of papal dominion. What did the papacy do with God's people? Slew God's people. So in the fifth seal, the souls that were slain under the fourth trumpet, under the fourth seal, what are they doing? They're crying out, Lord, until when? You can read this here. Until when do you not judge and avenge the, our blood on those who dwell on the earth? How long are you going to allow our blood to be shed? What is God's answer to them? Notice verse 11. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. So this first group of martyrs that were killed during the 1260 years, they're told, they cry out for justice, and God says to them, you're going to what? You're going to rest for a little while longer. But let me ask you, is there going to be another group of martyrs? Yes. yes. It says, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. So is there going to be a future group of martyrs? Yes, because the past group of martyrs cries out, God gives them a white robe, He says, you're safe, you're secure, you know, you're going to rest for a while until the rest of the martyrs die. When is it that the rest of martyrs are going to die? During that short time of trouble, right before the close of probation. And who is going to be the protagonist that is going to encourage that? It is going to be a resurrected Roman Catholic papacy. And let's go here to Revelation 2 verse 22. Indeed I will cast her into a sickbed. This is the fifth trumpet we're going to notice. The fifth trumpet is the deadly wound, the French Revolution, that, that makes the papacy inactive. So it says, indeed I will cast her into a sickbed, that is this harlot Jezebel, that worked during the 1260 years. And those who commit adultery or fornication with her, 
that is the kings of the earth, into great tribulation, that's the French Revolution, unless they repent of their deeds. Now what does it mean to cast her into the sick bed? Well, uh, notice what a, a very um, reputable lexicon says, Arndt and Gingrich, lexicon page 436, explains that this means to lay someone in a sick bed, that is, to strike her with an illness, Revelation, it gives Revelation 2.22, a lingering illness as what? As divine punishment. Was the papacy divinely punished? You better believe it. But what does Revelation 13 verse 3 have to say? The deadly wound is going to what? Heal. Heal. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed what? And followed the beast. Do you notice that the Elijah story broadens ever more? It's like throwing a pebble into a lake and then you have the ripples that go wider and wider. Where does the first Elijah uh, uh, minister? In Israel. What about the second Elijah? In Western Europe. What about the last Elijah? In the world. Are you with me or not? Now, Revelation 12, 17 describes end time Elijah. The dragon was enraged with the woman, he went to make war with the rest of her offering, or the remnant of her seed, I like better. And what do they do? They keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the spirit of prophecy. Let's read the paragraph at the top of page uh, 141. After the three and a half times, God raised up a people who keep the commandments of God, have the gift of prophecy, preach true worship to the Creator on His holy Sabbath, restore and proclaim the everlasting gospel, denounce Babylon, and lead the world to take a stand for the seal of God or the mark of the beast. This end time Elijah will enlighten the world with a loud cry. As Elijah brought fire down from heaven, the entire Mount Carmel was illuminated when he gave his message. Who is that end time remnant? That end time remnant is the Seventh-day Adventist, the faithful in the Seventh-day Adventist church. <laughs> I need to qualify that because Ellen White states that the most of those who are in the church will eventually leave, sadly. So did you understand what we studied? You really have a summary of trumpet four, five, six, and seven. <laughs>